sometimes the loudest thing you can do is sit back and be quiet. We live in a world that often encourages us to be loud and outspoken. And the challenge for me hasn't lied so much in accepting my loudness, but rather in accepting my quietness. And throughout my life, I've often noticed that I've focused on this more extroverted, louder side of me. And I was ignoring a quieter, more reserved part to my peril. I was in my second year of high school. And all throughout my years, I had been this goody two-shoes. And everyone knew that about me. But for some reason, on this specific day, I decided that I wanted to be cool. So I decided that I was going to skip half of my psychology class. It's very rebellious. And <clears throat> so I walked out onto this big concrete courtyard outside of the cafeteria in my high school. And immediately, a bunch of kids pulled me into this game of American football. And everyone started running around and throwing the ball. But as if it were yesterday, I remember this feeling of this wall just going up around me. I froze. And as hard as I tried to snap out of it, I couldn't. I couldn't even look anyone in the eye. So instead of removing myself from this uncomfortable situation, I decided that I was going to sit down in the middle of the courtyard and let everyone throw the ball over me and run around me. And someone even said, looked at me, and they were like, why is she sitting there in the middle of the game like that? What's her problem? I honestly don't think I remember a time in my life where I've been more embarrassed than this. But here's the thing. I didn't have a problem. There was just one thing that I didn't know. In that moment, sitting down, I was socially drained. And shutting down in this way was my body's way of telling me. You see, throughout my life, I had often been forcing myself throughout high school to be a more extroverted person. And the reason why I froze up in this moment was because I had spent and overspent this energy. And I wasn't taking any time to recharge the energy that I was spending. And this moment was kind of a light bulb for me, realizing that I had so much to learn about myself. And I'd like to tell you a few things that I learned. I learned that the main difference between an extrovert and an introvert is in our response to stimuli. An extrovert often needs lots of different types of stimuli, like big friend groups at school or lots of group work, to thrive and to function at their most optimal level. But an introvert, on the other hand, often needs far, far less of this, and sometimes none at all. But an ambivert is the combination of both extroverted and introverted traits. And freezing up in that courtyard as an ambivert was my quieter, introverted side telling me that I was experiencing too much stimuli. And throughout this journey, I had to learn to live as an ambivert. And it means constantly balancing the expenditure and the recharging of energy. Let me give you an example. Here at EHL, my weeks are filled with lots of meeting new people, lots of group work and communication with my peers. It's a lot of stimuli. So I know myself that on the weekends, I need to take a day to myself to recharge the energy that I've been spending. But I didn't always understand how to create this type of balance. And throughout my journey, I've learned three tools that have helped me balance my life as an ambivert. And I'd love to talk to you about them a little bit in the next few minutes. The first tool that I often use, and I still use all the time today, is learning that it is OK to set time for self-care. And I don't necessarily mean buying expensive skincare products or hair masks, which can be nice as well. 
What I mean is that I take a few minutes or an hour every single day or every other day to do something that makes me feel in touch with myself. And whenever I get this feeling of, oh, I'm so demotivated, I don't want to do my homework, I don't want to do anything, I've learned to turn to physical exercise. And it doesn't matter if it's a walk in the forest, if it's taking 30 minutes to cook something. What matters in that moment is that I let all those worrying thoughts, those worries, and those responsibilities just fall to the side. And I focus on how I'm feeling in that very moment. But there was a time in my life where I thought that self-care was something completely unimportant and just frivolous. I never paid attention to it. I did my first TEDx talk way back in 2019. It's actually not so long ago. <laughs> and I spent the weeks leading up to it constantly rehearsing, talking to my coach, talking to my peers about my speech. And I spent no time. I, I ignored my body's need to recharge. And after I delivered that speech, I was so socially drained that I had to spend two full days curled up on my little couch like a shrimp because I was so drained. And what had happened during those weeks leading up to the talk was that, again, I had spent and overspent this energy, completely ignoring the need to recharge it. But, well, I was sitting on the couch one day, and I was scrolling on Instagram, and I saw that one of my fellow speakers was at this big party, and they were partying all night. And I thought to myself, God, I wish, I wish I could do that. I wish I had the energy to do that. But I knew within myself that I didn't. But after a few years, I realized that in that moment, I could have had the energy had I managed myself differently. You see, in that moment, I didn't so much want to change my personality from an ambivert to a full-out extrovert. But what I could have done is changed how I managed the balance between the extroverted and the introverted side. And learning to do so is exactly how I can stand here in front of you all telling you about it. The second tool that I used was learning to set those necessary boundaries. I've learned that saying no is the key to saying yes in other situations. And I've noticed a pattern in myself where I say yes to plans or activities because I'm afraid that if I say no, I'm going to offend someone. And learning to set those boundaries is extremely challenging for anyone. But I've noticed that when I consistently overstretch myself in this way, I end up having less joy for doing things I would normally love. Another tool that I'm working on is uh, remembering the next sentence I'd like to say in my talk, but <laughs> that's, another, that's another story. But I was in my first semester, here at EHL actually, and I was walking to school one day and I thought to myself that I hadn't taken a day or some time to myself in many weeks. And I was starting to feel drained in this way that probably my daily double espresso wasn't really going to cut it for me anymore. <laughs> it wasn't enough energy. And I, I made a pact with myself. I said, OK, tonight, I need to stay in, do something that relaxes me, something that makes me feel myself again. But as soon as I walked into school, one of my classmates came up to me and they were like, hey, a bunch of us are going out tonight. You should totally come. And without even a second thought, I was immediately, of course, I would love to come. I'll be there. And I was ignoring this intuition that I needed to say no. What happens in those moments is that there's an extroverted voice, or part of me, if you will, that overrides or is louder than this introverted side. And it makes it really difficult for me to make these balanced decisions. 
And maybe it helps to think of it as an economy of energy. My extrovert is the spender, and my introvert is the recharger. And learning this balance is exactly how saying yes requires me to say no. And last, but really not least, I discovered the value in being fully quiet. Maybe, though, if you ask some of my friends or my colleagues that know me really well, if I'm this always this very reserved, quieter person, they're going to look at you like, you just grew an extra head or something crazy like that. And it's true, I'm an ambivert. So I don't always choose to be this more quiet person. But also, I've learned that being loud and vivacious does not necessarily give me value as a team member or as a leader. I got elected in my fourth year of high school as co-captain of the Nordic ski team. And at that time, I had barely any leadership experience at all, and I was convinced that to be respected by my peers, I needed to be the center of attention at all times. And after a few weeks of being the captain and trying to force this extroverted persona, I realized all it was doing was making me feel drained. So when I had the courage to accept my quieter leadership style, I realized I could notice so much more about my team. I noticed patterns, cohesions, and needs that I had never noticed before. I had discovered the value in being a part introverted leader. And I'd realized that actually, quiet leadership is not an oxymoron. But if you're an extrovert or an ambivert like me or even an introvert, where can you all start with all of this? And I remember at the beginning of my journey, I felt so overwhelmed, I had no idea where to start. It would have been nice if maybe Wikipedia had one of those step-by-step -step guides on where to start the journey. They don't, I checked. But if I were to give my past self a little bit of advice, this is what I would say. Start small. Like ridiculously small. Take five minutes in the morning before you even get out of bed just to meditate for five minutes or, or just do a little bit of stretching. And once that feels a little bit more like a habit, practice setting some of those boundaries with your friends. Say, guys, I need to take 10 more minutes to clean my room or to just do this assignment, then we can go. Nothing big. And when that feels a little bit less daunting, next time you're sitting with a friend, practice listening to them without jumping in and see just how much you can learn about them. And throughout this journey, I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned that it's really necessary for me to take time for self-care. <clears throat> and I've noticed that I thrive when I'm able to set boundaries and say no when I need to. And I've noticed that there's nothing weird or embarrassing about sometimes choosing to be the quiet one. But knowing what I know today, I want to take you all along with me. Back to the beginning when I was that little high school sophomore, second year, wanting to be cool and impress my classmates. And imagine me as I walk out onto the concrete courtyard outside of my cafeteria. And notice as I begin to feel uncomfortable. But this time, instead of forcing myself through the situation, I honor it. So I walk over to a tree all the way at the end, and I lay down, and I feel the prickle of the grass on the back of my arms. And I realize that in this moment, I don't feel left out. I feel peaceful. And I lift my head from the grass and watch as everyone's throwing the ball and running around and laughing. And I've realized that in this moment, it feels perfect. 
and to be sitting back and just being. And I've realized that once more, sometimes the loudest thing one can do is sit back and be quiet.